Okay, let's go over educational research. Now, when you look at this topic, I don't want you to be concerned. I'm not trying to teach you stats or advanced level stats or anything like that. The purpose behind this is that you can use this information to eventually make data-driven decisions. So, you know, how would a student do that through their educational career? Well, anytime you look at your grades and you're trying to determine performance in class, you're making data-driven decisions. So, how do we process that information? What information is most important to look at? How do we conduct some of this research so that we can use that information to improve our own learning? So again, not getting advanced on this, or, or not doing anything, or talking about any more information than we would normally talk about when we look at our quiz results each week. So don't be concerned about this. Don't let this scare you if you're not good at math. We're starting at the very lowest level. So that way we can have a conversation about how to use educational research. So the two main ways we're gonna do that in this class are through quantitative research and qualitative research. And we'll talk a little bit about what those mean in just a second. And then we're gonna also gonna look at the influence of exercise on learning. And you're, you're probably trying to guess why those two are even related. They are. And you'll see that as we go through the slides, exercise and research. And there's um, a connection there on the activity that we're going to do in class. Okay, data-driven decisions. So you need to have a, a basic level of understanding of stats in order to make informed decisions. You do that anytime you take a class to see how you're comparing, how you're doing in the class compared to norma normative data, like how you're doing to an average population. We give you a, a range from A being excellent, you know, B being above average, C being average, D being below average, and F being failing. So that kind of gives you a range, and, and most students want to at least be at that C level or above. They want to be, I, I mean, most students want to be above average, but some are just shooting for C level. But anytime you look at that information, you're making data-driven decisions, and you're looking at the data and you're making informed decisions about, oh, I need to improve my grade or, hey, I got to see C's get degrees. I'm good there. You know, so that's how some people look at their educational progress. They are academic learners. Some want that A. You know, they're like, that's all they're shooting for. That's all they don't care if it sinks in. They just want that A. But anytime they look at that range of scores, they're making data-driven decisions based on their performance. So now, at the beginning of the semester, I gave you a written pretest, and at the end of the semester, we'll do that same written pretest again as a written post-test. That allows you to kind of see how you improve, but it also allows me to see how you improved, and it's a way for me to quantify my teaching and a way to quantify your learning. Yes, it's only measuring the lower levels of, of learning. So when we look at Bloom's taxonomy, that's only really measuring memorization, understanding. It doesn't tell me, uh, can you apply this knowledge? It doesn't tell me if you can analyze, evaluate, or create something from the knowledge. But it is a way for me to kind of quantify my teaching. And I can improve the course over time. So I can look and say, okay, I added this to the class or we followed this process. So I try to make small changes over time so I can narrow down, was it effective? Or do I need to add something else in? So it allows me to, to improve my classes over time. So not only does the written pre and post test help you look at the information and say, okay, these are the important elements this instructor wants me to know and this is how much I improve throughout the semester, but it allows me to improve my teaching. All right, hypothesis versus theory. Real basic understanding. Um, you're gonna need to know how to create a hypothesis. Normally when you do a study, you try to 
test it against the null hypothesis. For this class, we're gonna keep it pretty simple. I just want you to create a hypothesis, an educated guess, and see if you can change it through some sort of research. So that's gonna be our application piece for this class. Now the difference between hypothesis and theory is a hypothesis is just an educated guess. Yeah, I have some background knowledge and I have these ideas, but they haven't been tested. And that's the key difference here is a hypothesis hasn't been tested or hasn't been tested enough to become a well-established theory. But a theory has. It's been replicated by other experts in the field and they've done it so much that it's become a well-established principle. It's been proven over and over and over again. So that's a theory and that's a hypothesis. A hypothesis is just an educated guess. It's somebody that has experience in that field of study and they want to test something out. So they have the background in it, and then they go out and create some sort of experimental design. Whereas a theory, there's been a bunch of hypotheses that have been tested, and they keep being replicated by other experts in the field to the point that it becomes a well-established principle. It's been tested and proven over and over and over again. So empirical research. So the two main types of empirical research that we're going to discuss in class are qualitative and quantitative. You've done this throughout your education. You do this throughout your life. You may not realize that you're participating in these types of studies, but you are. Anytime you've done a survey, it's qualitative. Like if somebody's asking you your opinion, like how do you feel about this? What are your thoughts on this topic? Like you know, this this is going to kind of date me, and kind of show the difference between our generations. When we used to go in malls back in the '80s and '90s, there would be somebody at the door wanting to ask us, wanting to ask us about a survey to take us a survey, and you know we'd try to run past them or whatever, or you know, when we were kids we'd just make up answers. But now you probably get a lot of surveys online. I know I do. And I know I get a lot through work as well. So you're always getting asked these questions. That's a form of qualitative research. Then you have quantitative. And the two can be used together. And I'll explain how in just a second. But quantitative is numbers, right? So we're gathering this data. It's objective. It's straightforward. My opinion doesn't really matter. The numbers are what matters. And my opinion shouldn't affect the numbers. They are what they are. So anytime you've taken measurements, that's an example of quantitative. So I want to do I want to give you examples that almost everybody has participated at some point in their lifetime and something that you would most people, on average, would have an interest in. So let's just look at exercise for a second. Since I have a background in exercise science, I want to give you an example that most people are interested in. So qualitative would be if you came to me and I was a personal trainer and I gave you this health history questionnaire and it asked you on there, now there are some quantitative assessments on there as well, but for the most part, it's qualitative. How do you feel about something? What's your opinion about exercise? How you know? It, it, it's asking you subjective questions, not something that's typically quantified. So I give you this health history questionnaire, and I go through, and I'm trying to get an idea of your goals based on these qualitative answers. But it also has some stuff on there that I can quantify as well. I can say, all right, how many yeses do I, did I get that was an interest in exercise or an interest in cardio? You know, how many yeses did I get where it was more of an interest in muscle strength? So I can quantify that to get a rough idea of goals that somebody may have. Or, or how many yeses did I get that related to losing weight or changing body composition? So qualitative assessment can be quantified. It can be put in numbers based on ones and zeros, right? You can use it like binary. You know, um, ones were yeses, zeros were noes. And then I can go through and I may have a chart that represents, okay, I know all of these. I had five out of the 10 that were related to weight. 
so they answered yes to that, or six out of ten, so or seven out of ten in that area. So I can see that they're really interested in losing weight. So there is a way to quantify qualitative data, but it's still objective. It's somebody's opinion. Whereas quantitative would be, all right, so I've given you this health history questionnaire, and then you come back to me the next day, and I say, all right, we're going to do pre-testing, physical fitness pre-testing. You've probably all done this when you were in elementary. So you may have done like the fitness gram testing. That was quantitative. How many sit-ups can you do? How many push-ups can you do? How far can you run in 12 minutes? Maybe you did the pacer test for fitness gram where you were running back, touching the line based on those beeps. That's all quantitative. If I take your blood pressure, it's quantitative. Those are numbers. It's not your opinion of what your blood pressure is. That's your blood pressure. So that's the difference between qualitative and quantitative. And I like to use that example because most of us have experienced that either in a doctor's office or maybe you were in elementary school and you had to do fitness gram testing. At some point in time, you've done those two. So basic stats. This is something we have talked about weekly. And maybe you didn't know why I always talked about it. And I, I really wanted to give you immediate feedback on how you did on the quizzes, but there was a reason why I pulled up those analytics in, in Canvas. I wanted to show you and get you in the habit of speaking the language of basic stats. So maybe if you didn't have a background in that in high school, you could see how they were used. You could see how I was using it. So averages. You want to know, are you above or below average? Anytime you look at your grade, if it's below a C, you're below average. If it's above a C, you're above average. That's what you're looking at. So on the quiz stats, you could see high scores, you could see low scores, but it also gave you average. What was the average score? And so since nobody else knew your individual score, only you know it, you could look up there without revealing anything and know where you stood on that quiz. So I, there was method behind my madness. So standard deviation, how spread out are the scores? So... Or, if you had a standard deviation of zero, that means everybody got the same score. Either there was a problem with that test or everybody was cheating. That's what it tells me as an instructor. If I look at a standard de deviation for even a group of students, so let's say, you know, in our class we have these little round tables and I told you, I don't want anybody talking on this quiz. I don't want any cheating. You know, normally we do these where y'all have conversations with them because I'm not really concerned about those quizzes. Those are the lower levels of learning. There's very little weight on them. It's just a way for you to kind of test and see if you retained the information from the lecture. But if I was going to be really strict, right? This is, nobody's talking on this. And then I saw one table had a standard, and I averaged out their scores, and I just looked at their data, and their standard deviation was zero means everybody got the same score. And obviously I could just look at the average and I could look at their scores and see that. But that tells me somebody cheated. If I looked at it for the class and there was a standard deviation and y'all were all spread out through the class, obviously either y'all were cheating through your phones or there was an issue with the test. Questions were way too easy or maybe it scored it wrong, what have you. Anyway, it tells me something. I can use that data and that's how standard deviation is used. So and we talked about this in class, right? I'd just tell you, okay, standard deviation was six, and then we would look at the normal curve and you could see how they were spread out. Whereas if we had a standard deviation of two, that means we would probably have a group of scores really close together. We might have a couple of outliers out there, but we could look at that normal curve and see where they were grouped at. So, Normal curve, you have that bell-shaped curve that we would see in class when we looked at the quizzes. That's a way to kind of look at standard deviation. And yeah, you can go one standard deviation above the mean, two standard deviations above the mean, and three standard de deviations above or below the mean. But for our purposes in class, let's just think of standard deviation as if how spread out those scores are on the normal curve. 
So the normal curve is a visual representation of averages and the standard deviation. We can see it. Same thing with normative data. We can take normative data, throw it into a normal curve, and see where we compare above or below the average. So normative data is important because, especially in fitness testing or even in a standardized testing. So you've taken the SAT, ACT. We want to compare you to an average population. The larger that population size is, the more reliable and valid the results are. So it's, it's, a, it's a form of sample size, right? But we have a lot of normative data that we use over time, especially for fitness testing, especially for the SAT. And we can compare you to that average population. Each time people take that test, the normative data grows, right? In, in some tests, not all. But we can keep adding, and we can get a more reliable, more valid test that is a better snapshot of what's truly going on. Sample size, same thing. So if I put you in a some sort of empirical research, so I'm going to do some sort of um, experimental design, and I only have one person in it, and I get these results. Like a lot of the stuff that you see on YouTube about diets, where somebody's doing a keto diet, or they're doing the carnivore diet, or they're doing the paleo diet. Well, some of this stuff does have some large sample size, but when you just see their results, that's a sample of one. That's not really valid. It doesn't really mean that it's going, the results are going to apply to a larger population. So you can't trust that stuff. So just because somebody gets those results, they could have had something else in their diet causing a problem that they just took out. Whereas you could be on that diet and there may be something in it that causes you a problem. So you, you can't trust a sample size that's small. So you need a large sample size. That's where that normative data comes in. Those are large sample sizes. There may be a million people in that sample that we're comparing to. That's the reason when people do studies, they try to get large sample sizes. And they report that information so that you can look and see, is it reliable? Is it valid? Just like the written pre and post tests that we do in this class, when I first started doing it, very small sample size. The very first class that did it, I couldn't really trust those results. But now I can take that data after doing this for 10 years, right, in like first aid. Uh, education, I don't have as large of a sample size, but in those kinese classes that I've been teaching for 20 plus years, as long as I've used that same test, I can throw that data and create this larger sample size. I was doing this for a long time to get a large sample size, a normative data set for amount of lunges the average person could do in a minute. There wasn't a lot of data. Cooper Institute put out a chart a long time ago and then they took it down and I can't find it anymore. So I'm like, I'm just going to create my own because I needed a test for lower body muscle endurance. And I was like, I'll just create my own. I get to see hundreds of students each semester and I have them do this test, and I'll just build my own sample size and get a rough estimate for this age group. So age also plays a role in it. Anyway, we're, we're, we're going off topic, but what I'm getting at is you can't trust small sample sizes. You need large sample sizes. So we talked about all this. Average, you may hear the term mean. It's useful when you're looking at the normal curve. Where are you above and below? Standard deviation, again, just revisiting this. How spread out are, are the scores? A standard deviation of zero means they are all the same score. If it's spread out, you see a, sam a standard deviation of 20, they are really spread out. Normal curve, it's a visual way of looking at averages and standard, de standard deviations. Like it shows you how spread out everything is, but it also, that center point, that peak of the bell is your average. So it's a visual way of looking at data. Normative data, it really allows us to look how we compare to an average population. And these are large data sets. 
in the thousands, sometimes in the tens of thousands, sometimes in the millions, right? We're, we're talking about coronavirus now, right? And so they're looking at number of illnesses related to how many people get it, right? How severe the illness is and what happens to these people. They're looking, and this data set is growing. The normative data set, we just didn't have information because it's a totally new virus, but now this normative data set is growing. The sample size is growing, and now we can have more accurate representations of what might happen. We've never seen this before, so that's why everybody's kind of confused. The reliability and validity of our estimates of our hypothesis is increasing now because we're having more and more people not just one culture but a bunch of different cultures so it may affect different cultures differently it may affect different societies differently on how they're set up right how much do they interact in person that's all going to change but we're looking at these sample sizes now and trying to get a guess how severe is this how bad is this situation or is it as bad as we even thought so all this stuff relates to what we're dealing with right now with the coronavirus. You know, what's the average population? What's the standard deviation? All of that applies. All right, now let's talk about correlations. I know this correlation doesn't mean causation. A good book to read would be Freakonomics. And they talk about how correlation doesn't mean causation cause causation doesn't mean that just because you see a correlation that those two things that one is causing the other that's what we mean by causation so the, an example they use in that book and an example you can find online is ice cream sales peak and, and murder rates go up at the same time that doesn't mean that ice cream sales are causing murder rates to go up it's just ice cream sales go up typically when things get hot and so more people go outside when it gets warm so therefore there are more bad people coming in contact with other people during that time so they have more interactions they have more chance for violence to occur that's what's happening but just because you see ice cream sales go up doesn't mean that somehow ice cream sales cause murders it's just there is a correlation between the two because they're both related to the increase in heat and the increased activity of people getting out because it's warmer. So just because somebody quotes a correlation doesn't mean that there is a causation. So correlations and prediction. Now you can make predictions. We use this a lot in sport performance. That's the reason stats are so important to athletics into teams and they start looking at these correlations and they can make predictions on who's going to do what based on previous performance and certain attributes that they have. So an example of a positive correlation, and here's one that students get confused all the time, and I used to get confused often as well. Positive correlation doesn't mean they both have to go up. They could both be going down. So here's a positive correlation that you can relate to your fitness program. As your weight goes up, so does bench press. Have you ever looked at strength training events? You look how big those people are. The main reason that's happening is muscle is denser than fat. So individuals with a lot of muscle for a person with the same height, is they're going to weigh more, right? Their bones are going to be denser. They're going to have more lean muscle mass. So they tend to weigh more because muscle is denser than fat for the same amount, right? If we're looking at the same amount in surface area, we're going to have a lot more weight with muscle. But there are some other things going on there. It's just a person that lifts heavy weights tends to have denser bones, tends to have more muscle mass, therefore weighs more. And as their weight goes up, it's probably because they're putting on more muscle mass, they can lift more. But for another ac athletic activity, and I'm sure y'all have all tried this, are pull-ups. So as your weight goes up, this is an inverse or a negative correlation where one goes up, the other one goes down. As your weight goes up, your number of pull-ups will go down. Obviously, if I weigh 400 pounds 
and I get over there on the pull-up bar, and I start trying to pull my weight up, I'm probably not going to even do one. But if I weigh a buck 30, like Zach that runs a climbing wall, I'm probably crank 20, 30, 40, 50 maybe pull-ups out because I weigh less. I'm pulling less weight, doing less work. So I like to give that example because most of you can relate to it. There's the difference between positive and negative correlations. Again, we're trying to keep this really simple. We're not going too in-depth. Independent and dependent variables. This is going to be important for the activity that we're going to do in class today. So pay close attention to this. So a dependent variable depends, there's your keyword, on the influence of the independent. All right, so it's in the name itself. It depends on the influence of the independent. So one of the easiest examples is growing a plant. And we often do this in class. Like I will give you either mushrooms to grow. I'll give you, because I've already grown the mycelium for you. I'm like, okay, I want you to put it under, you know, I'll let y'all create your own design, but I'll give you some ideas. And one of them would be plant growth. So the, it's easy, right? We can plant a bean in class. One gets more water, one gets more sunlight than the other. So the plant growth depends on the amount of sunlight it gets that it receives. Or you could do this another way. The plant growth depends on the soil that it was in. Or the plant growth depends on how much water it got. Or the plant growth depends on what type of water it got. Distilled water, spring water, tap water with all the chemicals in it. Or microwaved water will really impede plant growth. Something's going on there. So anyway, that's what we do in class. Or I'll give you mycelium that's already ready to sprout mushrooms. And we'll put it in a humid condition, a dry condition, and one with a lot of airflow, um, but still has moisture different soil types, um, so different things for it to spread through and grow mushrooms. So, And a simple one that y'all can do since we're doing this online during the coronavirus is, um, well, let's talk about this a little bit to get to the end. You can do physical measurements, but if you do those, you're going to have to do them individually. Because at least with the plant growth, it doesn't matter. Nobody's going to get your personal information. We've got to be real careful with any physical measurements. I don't want you giving your group members your weight. I don't want somebody to be shy about that or blood pressure. No health-related information needs to be passed on between group members. That's an easy one we can do in class because I can have you all go to the locker rooms and do this individually. We could do like girth measurements around the waist and the hip. But I don't want you all passing that around in your groups. Um, uh, another one that one group member did, or a uh, group did last, I don't know if it's last semester or semester after that, is they did fingernail length based on the vitamins that they were taking. And they measured it. Or hair growth based on the vitamins they were taking. So I don't care. The one thing is you have to have a dependent variable that depends on the influence of the independent. An easy one for you to do is plants. If you already have a plant growing, start giving one more sunlight than the other. And, and measure them at the beginning and see how much they grow. So one may even be smaller than the other one. But they need to be the same type of plant. If you don't have something like that, go dig a plant up in the yard that's pretty close, you know, same type, and, and put them in potting soil. And put them in one in a window, one not in a window. Or plant a bean. Um, dried beans that you have in your cupboard will work. They'll grow. I would put more than one in each. So put three in one, three in the other, and you can grow them out from there. We'll talk about that in just a second, but you get the idea. You've got a dependent variable, and the easiest way to do this would be growing a plant. But don't give any personal information to your group members. We can do that kind of stuff when we're in a face-to-face -face class. We cannot do it online because because of FERPA, we can't be trading personal information. Now, if you do it on your own, that's on your own. I'm telling you not to do it. I can't stop you. But um, in class, we can do a lot of exercise-based ones where y'all could implement a, a, a program. So what's happened before in the past is in class, we would say, okay, this group wants to change their weight. One group's going to do it through exercise. One's going to do it through nutrition. 
So, you know, this one group may try to walk more often throughout the week. It can be something really simple. Um, another group may be they're just going to take 200 calories out of their diet and see if their weight or girth measurements change. So it can be something really simple, but really online, since we're doing this in an online environment and trading information back and forth, I don't want y'all um, giving that kind of information. Do something like plant growth. Um, go plant some beans or something, or if you've got two house plants that are relatively the same size or the same type of plant, and give them different conditions. Just have fun with it. Don't make it too complicated. Don't overthink it. Multiple regression is really outside of this scope of this course. Um, I only mention it because it's just a more advanced way of looking at the influence of independent variables on a dependent variable. So the idea behind it, just in case you see it again, and only because I mentioned it in the previous slides, um, you might have plant growth affected by sunlight and soil nutrients. So those would be our two independent variables on one dependent variable. You would run a multiple regression to look at that kind of information as opposed to just a linear regression where you're plotting these out on X and Y. The reason I do mention linear regression in class is a lot of y'all are taking math courses or have taken them before where you were plotting things on an X and Y axis. And if you got a perfect straight line, then that's a perfect correlation. If they were scattered all over the place, then there was no correlation or very little between the two. That's how you visually look at correlations. And multiple regression would be more of a Venn diagram. I guess I could pull one up. I just want to show you real quick so that you um, know what a Venn diagram looks like. Try not to put in anything in there. So that would be our Venn diagram right there. So the amount of overlap, let's just say, let me look for a better image. Let's go in here. Just in case you can't see it, I'll try to find something in the center of the screen. All right. Well, I wanted to find one that was multiple ones. Okay. I like the color-coded ones. Wow, that one's complicated. All right. Anyway, let's look at one that's just two. You could do this with linear regression as well. This amount of overlap is your correlation. So if these were, the more overlap we get, the more correlated they are. Here we are, we have multiple um, overlap. Pepper and tomato, persimmon versus tangerine. I don't know what they're looking at there, but you get the idea. It's the amount of overlap indicates our correlation normally indicated by y hat don't get bogged down in this i just wanted to show you a visual representation one is the dependent one is the independent and the amount of overlap between the two this one's good because you got a b and c and how much they overlap one would be a dependent variable and how much these two independents overlap with the dependent anyway that gives you a visual Hopefully you could see that. I don't know if I had that on screen or not, but we'll find out. Experimental design, laboratory and field, there are more than those two types of experimental designs, but these are the most common ones, the ones that you probably can visualize in your head. Lab experiments are really controlled, so you're trying to really minimize any influence of anything else. Field experiments are convenient, so that you can, they're portable, so you can go out and do them in the field. Again, relating it back to exercise and exercise science, if you do a body comp measurement or you do the push-ups, sit-ups, and lunges tests, those are all field experiments. There is some measurement, a lot more measurement error in those than what you see in most lab experiments because there are so many things that can influence those and they're just not set up to be as accurate as lab, laboratory experiments. So exercise and learning, I told you there would be a link because I've talked about exercise all the way through here and I do have a background in it and I like for y'all to know how important exercise is to your learning. So the more you exercise, especially before learning, the, there are high increases in brain-derived neurotrophic factor, BDNF. And this is important if you relate it back to the anatomy of learning when we started talking about the different lobes of the brain and what's going on and the neural connections and forming new neural connections, brain-derived neurotrophic factor is extremely important for establishing and growing those new neural connections. So the more of it you have, the better off you'll be and the more you can retain of memories. So there's been a bunch, and I mean a bunch of research on exercises before you go in and learn. So they take these groups. Let's just say we're in EDC classes. We could easily do this at NLC. 
where we have groups of people come in, exercise in a workout class, and then go take an EDUC course. And then we have some groups that just normally just take their EDUC course. They don't do any exercise before they take it, and then we compare them. It has to be the same teacher and taught the same way, and we see how they do in class. And obviously time of day affects all of this, but they'd have to be at the same time of day. Same, so we could do one on Monday, Wednesday, one on Tuesday, Thursday. The Monday, Wednesday group gets exercise before learning. The Tuesday, Thursday group does not. And we could go in and measure their blood and look for BNF. BDNF, that would be one way to see how much is improvement. We could also do the written pre and post tests that I already use in class and see how much their scores improve over time and compare the groups. So that's one way that could be done here at Northeast Lakeview. So I just wanted to link that up. It is super important. That's why if y'all come to class before my, um, especially for my 930 classes, my early classes, if you ever come in super early in the morning, I don't even know if you can get in that early because um, they've been locking the building down to at, they don't open it up until 7.30 a.m. Before my office hours start, I go in and work out every day. It doesn't matter because I know I'm sharper, I'm clearer, I retain more information when I do that. I've done that all through my college career. It's really important to my learning, and I think that's why I outperformed a lot of my peers is because I always exercised prior to learning. And I do that with my work, too, because I'm still learning even in my work. All right, application activity. A lot of times I give you all a health history questionnaire in class. We're not going to do that this time because I don't want any personal information being passed around. If we get a chance in the face-to-face -face one, I could show you how it works, but I give you that health history questionnaire. So I could show you how a qualitative assessment works. And then we would do some sort of fitness pre-testing for those that want to do it. Uh, we're not doing it this semester just because I don't want any personal information being passed around online. But it would be a way to quantify. So we would do something simple like weight. Um, we could do something like girth measurements with weight for a body comp measurement. Some students that were really into it, I would go take them and let them do a body comp. But that is not required. So I've never required this. If individuals were not interested and trying to apply quantitative and qualitative learning or this empirical research using fitness means, I've always allowed them to do something like plant growth, something where they could create it. It would be simple and easy where there's no personal information passed around. And even for the groups that decided to, so that nobody saw their information, I'd let them go out and do their measurement in private. When they came back, I would take their data and graph it for them. So no nobody in their group would know their individual scores. So that's how it would typically work in class. We gotta be really careful in, in a college setting that nobody sees your personal information. So that's why I'm always real leery of stuff like that. That, why, that, that way, or that's why plant growth and the mushroom growth or measuring something like fingernail length based on multivitamin use or hair length based on multivitamin use is a good easy one. Nobody's going to know any personal information about you. Uh, you know, it's, it's just much easier to do. I like to use the fitness related stuff for those that I'm going to collect their data and graph it for them because it is something that most people are interested in. And I've had some students, even in EDUC, take up a fitness program because of it because they, they got really into it and then they integrated it into their life. I know this is a long lecture, but it's setting up the next three lectures. So I had to give you this information. It's super important. This application activity is extremely important. These measurements that you gain are going to be needed in these next three lectures that come after this. So now let me just look at the lecture note, go through. Hopefully you were doing these lecture notes as you watched it. Here's an example of a study that you can do. Your growth of the plant is going to be your dependent. The amount of sunlight it receives can be independent or it could be soil that it receives or water that it receives, whatever. You could go in and yell at one of the plants every day and they get all these other variables, but that's going to be the independent. Like the one plant that got yelled at and then the one plant that got praised, I don't care. 
I mean, whatever you want to do to see what changes growth works for me. But you, if you do the... I only mention this because one student did it in one semester. So they went in and yelled at one plant every day. And the other one, they gave it praise and they looked at the change in plant growth. All other variables were kept the same. But their dependent was plant growth and their independent was how much one got yelled at or the type of praise they received. So this is what you're going to do for the activity. And then that's what you'll submit online. Um, one main difference, and I don't have Canvas pulled up, instead of turning these lecture notes in, you're going to submit them like you did your templates. You'll see a little thing right below your lecture notes where you submit it. And just let me know if you have any problem. I'll be as flexible as I can. I know these are tough times. Some of you may have lost your jobs. Some may have family members that have lost their jobs. We're all in this together. Have a good time, and I'm here for you.